Dragon Slayer by Alex Piasecki This story is only one of many from the canon publishing military sci-fi fantasy anthology, Spring 2019, featuring many stories from many good authors. This is not a paid advertisement, but please, check it out. We'd been keeping eyes on this old dude's house. It was about four football fields away from the forward operating base, think little compound, our platoon occupied. He'd gotten our attention by watching us, sitting on his balcony, sipping chai, smoking shitty French cigarettes, and looking at us through an old set of Soviet-made binoculars. On one side of our compound was an open desert, occupied solely by this guy's house. On the opposite side of the compound, we had a residential district, but right up against our little Hesco barrier fort. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why didn't we round up a couple of squads and go kicking in this dude's door? Had this been a few years earlier, that's exactly what we would have done. But, the rules of engagement were different now. We were there to help rebuild. On paper, we weren't supposed to be an occupation force. Unless he was aiming rifle at us or actively planting an IED in the street. We weren't supposed to do anything except observe him. Yeah, it's stupid. Maybe if we had a different, more aggressive colonel in charge of the battalion we were attached to, who wasn't actively looking to trade his oak leaf for a bird, we could have done a hard knock on this dude with suspicion only, and said, Howdy, with some force. Maybe if we weren't supposed to be handing everything over to the locals and not relying on them for shit like that. So, technically, nothing had happened that could be attributed to an observer. Accurate mortar fire, convoys getting ambushed on the way in or way out of the compound, that sort of thing. In fact, we noticed nothing. So, he watched us and we watched him. One of the things we noticed was that a car would roll up every few days and three people would get out. Two adults and a child. The adults would stay for a few hours and come back out to the car without the child. It was usually the same two men. Once in a while, one of them was switched out with a third man. We figured that the third guy was covered for when one of the other two was sick. Or something like that. The car was always the same. An old lot of sedan, white with orange fenders. Painted like a typical local taxi. The child was never the same. Sometimes it was a boy. Sometimes it was a girl. Sometimes we couldn't tell. We were hoping there was an exit around the back that we just couldn't see. Because we'd never see a child come out. I should point out that he knew we were watching him. I remember one time I was standing in one of our FOB towers, checking out the house with the optic on my rifle. I remember the place looking old, foreboding in a way that all old structures seem to have about them. I was slowly scanning the second story when my scope was filled with his face. It made me jump a little, and truth be told, I almost pulled the trigger on him. Wish I had. It was well within the range of an M4 carbine. It looked old real old. He'd hit that age where your features start melting into wrinkles. And he'd hit it hard. He lowered his binoculars and seemed to be staring right at me, his eyes boring into mine through my optic. He had a pretty neutral look on his face. I mean, for a guy who knew he had a rifle aimed at the bridge of his nose. We stared at each other for a few minutes before he slowly nodded at me in a very solemn and respectful way. I raised my hand and flipped him off. I don't know whether he saw it, or even knew what the gesture meant. He gave me no indication. I hope he did. He just kept watching. Our platoon commander kept sending up to hire that something shady was going on with this guy, and requested permission to at least do a soft knock. That's where we just knock on the front door and talk to him for a bit. Toss his house without putting him in flexi cuffs and slapping him around. Hire said the same thing every time. Sounds like a local law enforcement issue. Let them handle it. We told local law enforcement, whom we worked with, to find what this dude was up to. When we said what house he was in and what he looked like, they all got nervous. Said it was, or at least claimed to be, a Sufi Wali. For those that don't know, the Sufi are a branch of Islam that's more focused in finding God within yourself. And sometimes they get a bit spooky weird. But they're generally pretty cool. 
Not the sort that should make men holding rifles look like scared little children. Or, for that matter, has kids dropped off to them by shady taxi dudes. A Wally is, as far as I can explain, a really smart philosopher. Something more than a high school English teacher, but something slightly below a wizard. No one knew when he'd taken up residence in that house. He'd always been there, even when they were kids. That's all he would say. You could tell they were holding back a lot. You could tell they were scared too, but they held back on that as well. We watched the locals knock on this dude's door from behind rifle optics, binos, and cameras. The whole platoon, at least those not otherwise occupied, were in the position to watch. It seemed like everybody wanted to know what was going on. They, the cops, were terrified. Looked like they were about broke and ran the second the door creaked open. Their lieutenant and sergeant, or at least local equivalents in rank, spoke to the man briefly. We saw him look around the compound through our cameras super offended look on his face. He was pissed. I could tell that much. He yelled something at our local partners. Couldn't tell what he was saying. But I know a how fucking dare you speech when I hear one. Or at least see one through a camera mounted on a five story tall tower. We'd worked retail before. The weirdest thing was that the cops took it. We'd watched these cops beat the fuck out of people for the slightest of things. Dirty look? That's a beating. Bumped into one of them? That's a beating. Didn't have bribe money on you. Oh, you bet that's a beating. But this old man had their asses locked down and scared shitless. When he slammed the door in their faces, they all seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. It was strange. These dudes were mostly Sunni Muslims, so a philosopher from a different sect shouldn't have had them so spooked. But as they mounted their trucks for the short drive back to our compound, they were noticeably shaken like they'd just gotten out of a pissing match with the devil. Once our local partners came back to the compound, however, they acted like nothing of note had gone on. They told us the old man wasn't a threat, just watching us because he was bored. That would have been an almost acceptable story, if we hadn't watched him verbally flock them all. Oh, and all the disappearing kids, which they'd somehow forgotten to ask about. We asked them if everything was okay. Everything, according to them, was fine. Which was about what we expected. The local culture dictated it was okay to lie to save your honor. Even if a senior citizen had had you pissing yourself just a moment prior. We kept on watching the old man in the house. About a week passed, and the local imam, or priest, for those of you who aren't hit with the Islamic lingual, decided to pay us a visit. This dude was actually pretty cool. It was all about Somala and brokered no bullshit. When foreign radical extremists were pushing into the area, he usually knew about it, and half the time his boys would handle it outright. But he wasn't there for that. Sort of. He'd somehow gotten wind of our curiosity about the old man. No surprise there. He knew about everything going on in his patch. He showed up requesting to speak to our leadership. He sat down in the smoke pit of our FOB with our platoon commander and platoon sergeant. I was hanging out next to our trucks with the rest of my fire team, trying to look busy examining random spots of tan paint on our trucks, making sure it was all still tan, keeping an ear pointed in their direction. It was a short, quiet conversation, and I couldn't really catch the gist of it. Our platoon sergeant quickly grew a pissed look on his face, and our platoon commander started looking a little uncomfortable. They both, at different points, turned to look at the wall of our compound in the direction of the old man's house. After about 15 minutes, they abruptly rose, conversation abruptly done, and shook hands. They departed and went off in different ways. My platoon leadership towards the little operation center we had on the FOB, and the imam heading towards the front gate, which took him past us. I nodded at him, and he nodded back. He left his eyes on me for a good second before he pointed in the direction of the old man's house. Pay him no mind, he said. I'd never spoken with him before, and his voice held a surprise. A British accent. Something in my expression must have said, The fuck you talking about, pal? Because he went on. It is our problem, he responded to my expression. And if Allah wills it to be solved, it will be solved by us. Inshallah. What is it? I asked, not breaking eye contact with him. A problem, 
he said curtly before walking off. I'm good at solving problems, I called after him. He made it to the gate of our compound before he turned and looked back at us. He looked down, his eyes closed. His lips moved, like he was muttering something. Then he looked back up at us. Perhaps you are, but there are some evils we must tolerate in this world. I cannot know Allah's will, but I will assume he has a very good reason for allowing that thing to walk amongst us. Did you say thing? I'm going to speak to Allah. He cut me off, his voice the definition of solemn. I'm going to beg him to grant you the wisdom to look the other way. It is an American thing, I think, for you to try to change the world. That can be a force for good, and it can be a force for chaos. I will pray that Allah grants you wisdom before you act. Tell Allah I say hi! My saw gunner called out to him. He was a smartass with no filter. I shall, he said before leaving the compound. He either hadn't gotten the joke, or he was secretly just as much of a smartass. That night, it was made clear that Allah hadn't checked his phone and had missed the voicemail from the Imam. I was still up. I didn't sleep a lot of those days. I was bullshitting with the COC night crew, the guys who were running the operation center I mentioned earlier, when my eyes wandered over to the God's Eye camera. It was focused on the old man's house. The camera was in floor mode, which meant it was picking up heat. It was better than regular old night vision. Hotter things appear in more vibrant shades of white, depending on the temperature, and colder things showed up in darker shades of gray and black, as opposed to the traditional night vision, where everything is just green. I know you might be wondering how a heat vision camera would work in a hot desert. The answer is... fucking science. I don't know. You looking at the house? I asked. No choice, one of the cock jockeys responded. The shit that turns the cameras broke. Camera won't cycle off of it. Ran a systems check on it. Everything's coming up all good. Fuck, it still won't turn, though. Somebody else might be sitting in the control of the camera, but it's supposed to tell us. I nodded and stared at the image. The American war machine ran off garbage built by the lowest bidder. A broken shit that turns the camera wasn't a surprise. The phrase military grade is an amusing inside joke. The front door of the house flew open. A white shape that looked like a short person or a kid came tearing out at a dead run. Yo, check this shit out, I said, instinctively reaching forward and hit record button on the station's console. The two cock jocks focused on the screen. Now that I think back on it, it was pretty coincidental that I happened to be looking at the camera at that exact time. But that's just how shit lines up sometimes. The kid was about halfway around the house when another heat signature exited the door. This one was a lot brighter. A lot fucking brighter. Floor cameras don't have a lot of definition. Like, if you looked at a head, you could make out ears, maybe hair, but you couldn't see a face. I could vaguely tell that whatever was chasing that kid was moving with bipedal locomotion, but that was about it. It was throwing off a ton of heat. It had a wild distortion effect. It was almost like I was watching a fire take a walk. If that makes sense. Holy shit. The voice came from behind us, just as the bipedal campfire caught up to the kid on the screen. It was our platoon sergeant. No idea when he showed up in the cock. He had a befuckled look on his face which probably matched mine. We all watched whatever it was snatch up the kid and start dragging it to the door. It was hard to notice that the kid's white shape started to dim, almost like the walking fire was draining him of body heat. We could tell the kid was fighting him every inch of the way. His fist punched into the distortion, and the walking fire pretty much ignored his attempts at self-defense. Fuck this noise, the platoon sergeant said. He looked at me. Get your boys, get your bad attitude on and stop that shit. Just go. I'll get the rest of the boys out there. Rah, was all I said before I was heading towards the door. The platoon sergeant grabbed my arm and brought me up short. Look, he said, getting a bit timid in his voice. The imam said some weird shit about this guy. I know it's fucked up. I know it's fucked up, sending a single fire team out, but something's pushing me on this one. I don't know what. 
he said, shaking his head. More to himself than to me. When you get in there, it might be weird. If you got to smoke this asshole, hit him hard. Real hard. With that bit of confusingly cryptic nonsense, I was out the door. I didn't care if something was weird in there. All I knew was that that kid was in a fucked up situation. That's enough to get me moving. I got the boys up, telling them to get their game faces on. Plate carries and gear went on over sleeping gear. Putting on proper uniforms would have only slowed us down. We had a door to kick in. Tempest Fugin. I made sure they had boots on, though. I'm not a complete dumbass. We all piled into the Humvee we were supposed to be responsible for. The rest of the platoon was finally starting to move as we left the gate. I'll say this for my guys. Not a single one of them asked why we were going in on our own. I think we all wanted to get into that house and figure out what was happening. We all wanted to be the hero riding over the hill to save that kid's ass. We shot down that road to the house going as fast as that underpowered diesel engine would let us. The night sky looking down on us and probably shaking its head. I filled the boys in on what I'd seen, leaving out the bit that made the camera weird. We were heading into this situation alone and I'd prefer to keep my boys unafraid. The Humvee kicked up a rooster tail of sand and rocks as my saw gunner brought us into a drifting sideways stop outside the old man's front door. It was dangerous to drift an up armored with its high center of gravity, but fuck it. I remember thinking, save it for the debrief. We were all doing some real cowboy shit, charging the house without immediate backup and no inner or outer cordon set up. What's one more notch on this dumbass stick? I'd never been this close to the house, not even when we drove past it. I don't know if you've ever rolled up on something or someone you plan to violence the hell out of, but your internal adrenaline nozzle gets kicked wide the fuck open and you're absolutely fucking ready. It's like you just had six cups of coffee, bumped a rail of coke and crushed up Ritalin. Super focused, yet super wired. You fly through that front door with your kill stick on go, and you're just chomping at the bit to use it. It's an amazing feeling, and I can see why people get addicted to it. But even in that state, I was taken aback by the weird shit emanating off this house. To stare at it was to feel like you were looking at a different world through an underwater mirror. Looking straight at it, it gave off this odd wavy effect a highway in the desert does when you're thirsty. I swear I kept seeing things moving out the corner of my eye too. Fuck it, and fuck the corners of my eyes. I focused on my purpose for being there. Get that kid out of a fucked up situation. One of my guys, a tall lanky dude from Philly we call Creepy, put his hand on the door of the Humvee and leaned on it, like he was about to be sick. I grabbed his arm and we moved past him, pulling him towards the door. Shake it off, Creepy. We're about to be in it. He nodded and fell next to me. My saw gunner and the fourth member of our party posse, a short dude from Riverside, California named Gatto, who fell in behind us. My saw gunner, who went by the nom de gare chompers, pulling my rear security. We were stacking on the door when the smell hit me like a sack of doorknobs to the nasal cavity. A mix of brimstone, dead flesh, and something only describable as rotten lemon-flavored milk. My eyes watered, but I ignored them. Gatto got to the other side of the door, and when I nodded him, he gave it a donkey kick. With the sound of an old sun-baked timber giving way, the door crashed inward. One thing sticks out to me as I write this. The door didn't bounce back. It just stayed open, like it was beckoning his in. Usually when you kick in a door, it bounces back on you after it hits the wall. Not this door, though. The significance of that didn't really register on me in the moment. As we flowed into the house, the smell came out to greet us. Our eyes watered and I started getting the heebie-jeebies. It didn't help that the floor was covered in something with the viscosity of motor oil and duck shit, forcing us to watch our collective step. Creepy came up short, looking up at the ceiling. I plowed into him, attempting to get through him. When you're moving into a house and the guy in front of you stops moving, you assume he's been shot and get him the hell out of the way so you can bring your gun up to fight. 
Once it was taught, you should grab him by the carry strap of his body armor, hold him up, and shoot around him, using him as a human shield. That's pretty fucked up, though, so it wasn't a tool I added to my toolbox. As soon as I got past Creepy, my body checking him out of the way, I stopped short as well. Chompers and Gatto were kind enough to go around me instead of bowling me over. We're in a large room. It was dark. The only source of light was coming from the ceiling. A brilliant blue light, bright as its source, were casting mostly shadows around the room. As if, despite the brightness of the light, it just didn't have enough power to push into the rest of the room. I'm sure the look on my face could be described as befuckled, because the source of the light appeared to be a child, suspended face down from the ceiling. Arms around his sides, one foot over the other. I noticed Gatto making the sign of the cross as he saw the crucified boy. His belly was split open, and a long loop of intestines dangled down beneath him. Shit, fuck! I involuntarily exclaimed. I had to get this kid down, but I couldn't keep my eyes open. Between the intense light and the overall weirdness of the situation... In the eye-water and stench of the room, I felt like I was going to puke at any second. I was aware of my firing team taking up position around me, weapons pointed outward. There were three doorways out of the room. We had a gun pointed at each one. I noticed weapons lights started to flick on out of the corner of my eye. Holy shit, Creepy muttered as his light revealed what was hidden in the shadows. Death. Lots of death. Pieces of dead kids littered the room, piled on top of each other. The walls were covered in blood, both wet and dry. That explained why the floor was slick. About a half inch thick layer of, and I'm only guessing by what was on my boots later, what looked like blood, fecal matter, and guts that had been pulped into some sort of quasi-liquid substance. It was a brutal slaughterhouse in there. At first, the pieces of kids looked like they'd been thrown around the room. But then I realized there was a sort of order to the madness. Heads go in the corner, feet on the pile, hands on that one. For some reason, the image of those little hands in that pile hit me the hardest. Some outstretched, some curled into little fists, some whole... Some missing chunks and fingers. Some hands bigger, other hands... smaller. It's the sort of thing that makes your mind want to shut down. Too much to take in. Every man handles things differently. As was demonstrated by my fire team. I watched a tear roll down Creepy's face as he took in the shit show. Gatto, a devout Roman Catholic started to pray quietly, eyes open and glued to the doorway he was covering. Jumpers, Jumpers looked sick, sick and pissed. He returned his attention to the doorway he was covering. What's the play? He asked, with some steel in his voice. His voice might have sounded like the bastard child of Clint Eastwood and Sam Elliott, but he looked like he was about to puke. He was keeping his head in the game, though. Gotta give him that. We get this kid down and bounce the fuck out. Yup. Creepy said quietly. I don't think I can stomach much more of this place. All right, I responded, looking up at the kid trying to figure out how he was held up there. Fuck clearing this place. We don't have the numbers and if this kid is alive, he needs help. We go for him right here in this room till the kid's down. What about the old man? Asked Jumpers. You see him. You kill him. Violently. The old man's sins were on display, and any notion of possible forgiveness was non-existent. It was right after I told the boys they were cleared hot to smoke this motherfucker that it started. Laughter. Soft laughter. Like someone in another room laughing. It seemed to be floating out of all three of the interior doorways. That ratcheted up the creep level by a factor of at least a fuck ton. 
It didn't sound like the laugh of a cartoon supervillain. It sounded like a happy old man sharing his mirth with the world. Yeah, hurry the fuck up, bro, Creepy said as he looked over at me. Doing my best, I replied, with more than a few nerves in my own voice. The lights on our weapons started to dim at that point, like the batteries were dying. Creepy reached down and smacked his light, trying to get a full amount of lumens out of it. I knew he had a fresh battery in that thing. We all did. And there was no logical explanation for the lights dying out this fast. The growing darkness was adding to the mountain tension in the room. I think it was the house. Or the occupants of the house. Letting us know that we weren't welcome. I looked up at the kid. Staring at him directly. It was like staring at an LCD light. The kind of douchebags put on luxury cars. I pulled my dark lens safety glasses out of my pouch on my body armor and slipped them over my eyes. It helped a little. The kid looked like he'd been crucified to the ceiling. But I couldn't see what was affixing his hands and feet to the drywall. I pulled the stool over to the center of the room and stood on it. I got up closer to the kid. His eyes were open and he was staring back into mine. His eyes looked dopey like someone with a bad concussion. Some sort of black substance was covering his mouth. Upon closer inspection, it looked like a cross between old dried blood and shit. I reached out to touch the kid's exposed intestine. It was hanging out through a small gash in his belly. Just big enough to put some intestines through. More of that black shit being used as crude bandage around the base of the exposed intestine. Leaving the loop of the gut ropes hanging out, but keeping the kids' red stuff in. I figured, given the kid's state, some sort of anesthetic had to be in play, but when I touched the intestine, his whole body jerked, and I could hear him scream into the patch, keeping his mouth closed. The thing that fucked with me the most? What was the point of this? Was this just a fucked up game? Pull the rope, get a scream? Fuck. I whispered to myself. I was going to have to pack this kid's guts before I could figure out how to pull him down. I got movement in the hallway. Ghetto said through gritted teeth. He'd slung his rifle and was now aiming the Marine Corps issued Remington 870 shotgun he usually carried on his back down the hallway. Me too, Creepy said. Chompers growled out something that meant he too had movement. Neanderthal. What you telling me for? I responded as I was tearing open the Israeli bandage. Shoot the motherfucker! Getta responded by firing down his hallway. I was instantly half deaf. In the light put out by Gatto's muzzle flesh, I saw something standing in his hallway. And no, nothing about it looked human in the slightest. In that split second, there was something that was all spikes and teeth. And that's about all the description I got. There was a response. A roar sounded like a lion getting kicked in the nuts. Most likely it was louder, but I was still half deaf from the gunfire. The shotgun blast either knocked it back or drove it off. I'd have hoped for dead, but I didn't get the feeling the world was in a wish granting mood. I started wrapping the kid's intestines with the plastic packaging the bandage had come in. It sucked because I had to coil the intestines in order to wrap them and that made the kid jump and jump hard. Imagine someone reaching into your stomach and fiddling around with stuff. I felt bad for the little dude. Chompers picked that moment to let off a 10 round burst from his saw. I felt even worse for the kid. I'd been doing my best to be delicate, given the situation, but the sudden noise and the strobe effect of that muzzle flash had really fucked up my equilibrium. I think I must have yanked too hard because that kid's body buckled again and I heard a muffled scream. Fuck, sorry, fuck, shit, sorry, shit. I kept repeating quietly as I worked the bandage around his belly as delicately as I could. Creepy sent rifle fire down his hallway and I heard another roar. Chumper started to play a tune on his saw and Ghetto added percussion with the deep bass roar of his shotgun. I managed to get the kid wrapped up and ready to move, which wasn't fucking easy to do. Standing in the middle of an indoor firefight. The noise of the rounds going out. The roaring of whatever was catching those rounds. The strobe of the muzzle flashes indoors and that rancid stink. Now mixed with the cordite and gunpowder was starting to kick my ass. 
I think I ran out of adrenaline too as I felt I was on the verge of passing the fuck out from exhaustion. I was trying to brainstorm a way to get this kid down. There was literally nothing holding him to the ceiling. I felt up and down his arms and got a hand around the back, looking for something to unravel a break. My search yielded nothing. Screw it, I said, and reached up to the kid realizing I had to get him down, and there wasn't really any way I could do it without him feeling some pain. I hugged him, careful of his packed guts, and started to pull down. At first he didn't budge. I had to almost hang my body weight off of him to get him to go a little. But I got him to move. I noticed the further I got him down, the more the blue light emanated from him flickered and grew dimmer. It felt like pulling an old boot out of mud. It was coming down, but it wasn't fast. Some serious gypsy nonsense was holding that kid to the ceiling. The gunfire trickled to a stop. Reloading! I heard Gatto yell as he fed shots to his shotgun, creepy covering with his M4. Chompers had the top cover of the saw open and was feeding another belt into it. They looked tense as fuck, and I couldn't blame them. They were most likely going off muscle memory at this point. I doubted we were out of harm's way yet, but it seemed there was a lot of shadows in the doorways. I'd have asked them how they were doing, but they were probably all as deaf as I was at that point, and had other shit to focus on, like the doorways in the room that was getting darker. I pulled at the kid again. The light he put off was getting dimmer and dimmer. He was still bucking against me as I kept jarring his intestines. The mercy of passing... I had no idea how this kid hadn't been granted the mercy of passing out. My hearing was starting to return as I got one of his arms free. He wrapped it around me. I heard whispering. I figured it was the boys conversing amongst themselves, trying to figure out just what the fuck is going on. But I realized the whispering wasn't in English. It wasn't Arabic either. It was something else. It sounded like nothing I'd heard before. I ignored it. I was focusing on pulling the kid down from the ceiling. The whispering continued, but it was getting faster, louder. It did a great fucking job of driving home the urgency of the situation. His other arm came free, and he wrapped around me too. The whispering was starting to sound like loud talking, and there was a distinct angry tone to it. The room was getting a lot darker now. Dark enough I could see the glow-in-the-dark cat's eyes on the back of Gato's helmet, staring right back at me. Cat's eyes are great. Little bits of glow-in-the-dark plastic on a band that goes around your helmet lets you know if the guy you're about to shoot in the back is a marine or not. The darkness was about to become a bigger problem than it already was. Throw some chem sticks down those hallways! Almost had to yell over the talking, which was starting to get closer to shouting. I was starting to hear the occasional English or Arabic word mixed in with the unknown language. Random shit. The boys each cracked a chem stick. One was red, one was green, and the other was purple. They tossed them underhand. Purple and green clattered down the respective hallways, free of any obstruction. But red hit something at chest height and bounced to the deck. It was standing there, peering into the room from the hallway. The red light didn't make it look good, but, to be fair, it did a good job of looking like a fucking nightmare on its own. Whatever it was, it was a big motherfucker covered in oily black skin. Bony growth jutted out at odd angles. The eyes had wide irises that stretched the side of its sockets, but didn't touch the tops or bottoms. Its head was all teeth and wrong angles. It looked like some seriously bad shit. Now, that sounds terrifying, right? But the whole night had been terrifying up to that point. So one more horror stacked up next to a room full of torn up kids just didn't have the effect it would have had, had it just point blank to us. Somebody shoot that fucking thing already. Ghetto laid into it with a 12 gauge buckshot. Chomper spun his saw up and started drumming holes into it. He staggered back and disappeared into the darkness. It was at that moment the kid came free. I damn near fell off the stool but creepy caught us. I turned around, holding the kid tight in my chest. Marines! I shouted as loud as I could. We're leaving! If the room had had an aura, that aura would have been pissed. I don't think it was too happy about our invasion, 
much less our attempts to ace its monsters. I detected a light rumble underneath my boots, coming up from the floor, and I noticed it was rumbling at a certain pace, sounded not unlike a heartbeat. I held the kid against my chest. It finally passed out. Not say good for him, but now we had to worry about shock and things like comas. Brain damage wasn't out of the picture either. I was holding my M4 by the pistol grip, ready to fire one-handed if need be as we backed towards the door in a loose formation. Guns pointed outward. Creepy was behind me, running point on the movement back to the front door. Gatto and Chompers were in front of us, providing rear security. What? A voice boomed out of the encroaching darkness. It's mine! The voice sounded like it came from everywhere, and at the same time, nowhere. For all I knew, it came out of the fucking walls. Wouldn't have been the strangest occurrence of the evening. I didn't respond to the voice. I had a fairly good idea it was talking about the boy. I ignored the words. Didn't really know if I wanted to understand the implications behind them. Who calls a kid that? He's on back now, boys. Nice and steady. I said quietly to my guys as we slowly moved back into the entryway. It was damn near pitch black in the house at that point. Moving at a quick pace could get us tripped up on something. Door's not here. Creepy said. No trace of panic in his voice, just stating the fact. What? There's not here. He repeated himself. I heard him knock fist against the wall. It's just a wall now. I turned my head and looked back at the lanky marine running his gloved hand across a bare wall where the door should have been. You sure this is where we came in? Bet my left nut on it. That's not good. I saw the dim outline of Creepy's helmet turn my way and shake in the negative. Well, shit, boss. I turned my head back to the front and felt a chill run down my spine. Shit was getting real fucking stupid. Try stabbing at it. See if you can make a new doorway for us. I heard the machete Creepy kept on his backpack clear its scabbard. The sound of metal blades scraping against something like rock followed. No go. Well, fuck. Sitting there, all indecisive and shit, wasn't going to get us out. I had to make a call. So, I did. Guess we're going to go through this house until we find a way out. I said, without much enthusiasm in my voice. Looking great. Gato responded from in front of me, sounded more annoyed than anything. We should have brought the fucking NVGs. We should have brought the rest of the platoon with us. Chomper shot back. I could hear panic creeping around at the edges of his voice. The soft laughter returned, sounded like it was oozing out of the walls. Gato shook his head. I knew because the cat's eyes on his back of his helmet briefly shook back and forth in the dark. I could almost imagine the annoyed look on his face. You have made a mistake, the laughing voice said. You think I would let you come into my house and take what is mine? Arrogance. I felt a small ball of panic starting to form in my gut. The events of the night started to push in on me. Normally I can check my emotions, stuff them down until a hairy situation. Monsters in the dark, dead kids, disembodied voices. The sink. It was all starting to get to me. Especially now that we're trapped like rats in a sinking ship. Contact! Jumpers called out before letting loose a burst from his saw, firing into the room we'd just left. The muzzle flash illuminated a room devoid of life. The piles of body parts were still there, but nothing else. Chompers was either firing at figments of his imagination, or being fucked with. The big money was on the ladder, in my opinion. Stray 5.56 rounds were punching into the piles of body parts, sending little bursts of flesh and dried blood spattering about but there seemed to be nothing worth wasting ammunition on in the room. He twigged to that and ceased fire. The room felt darker after a sudden burst of fire and noise. The kid slung across my shoulder didn't move, so I figured he was still knocked down. My ears were ringing, but I could still hear the laughter spilling out from nowhere. You do nothing but put holes in my meat. The voice positively boomed out, malicious glee soaking every syllable. That's, uh, that's what she said. Gotta replied quickly, but timidly. 
Our first response to the voice was a smart-ass pop culture reference. In keeping with the finest traditions and highest standards of the United States Marine Corps. Did this motherfucker just return fire with an office quote? I remember quietly saying to myself. I could see the vague outline of Chomper's shoulders shaking as he tried to stifle a laugh. Creepy was doing one of those snort laugh things behind me. I tried to chuckle quietly to myself. I tried to stomp that down, but it was just so damn ridiculous. Before I knew it, I was laughing my ass off. The boys joined me. Big old horse laughs all around. But the house didn't seem to join in on mirth. I felt the ground beneath my feet rumble again, harder than before. A roar issued forth from the darkness, a long and loud one that did a good job of quelling our laughter. If I hadn't known any better, I'd say the house, or the voice, felt a mite insulted that we weren't shitting ourselves with terror. You find humor in this? The voice asked, an incredulous, hostile note in his voice. Do you think you will live? I will tear out your souls. I will eat your hearts. I will burn your meat. Nothing will be left of you to be held in judgment. Burn. That word stuck out to me. Burn. An idea kicked me in the frontal cortex, or where the fuck ideas come from. Burn. Hey, creepy. I whispered over my shoulder without taking my eyes off the room in front of me. You still got that Willie Pete grenade? Yeah? He responded, followed by a sound of a pouch snapping open and something pressing into my shoulder. I let my rifle fall to the sling, reached up, and took the can-shaped grenade from him. Now, if you don't know what a Willie Pete is, well, it's white phosphorus. We use it to mark targets, create smoke screens, that sort of thing. Fun fact about white phosphorus. It burns at more than 3,000 degrees, and it won't extinguish until it burns itself out. The grenade in my hand could ensure anyone within 17 meters would have a bad fucking day. Per the Geneva Convention, we aren't allowed to use white phosphorus as an offensive weapon. Party poopers. Back in the day when this shit was used as an offensive weapon, they'd have to dig still burning chunks of it out of people with knives to even start assessing wounds. Truly evil shit. Hey, fuckface! I held up the grenade as I yelled into the darkness. You know what this is? The rumbling on my feet dialed back a little, and the roaring quieted down. I took that as a house being perplexed. Pretty sure it wasn't used to being called a fuckface or yelled at by anybody who wasn't on the verge of terror-induced myocardial infraction. If I had to describe the reaction, I would say it was like when a wild dog charges you. But you start barking and running at it, and it pauses in its tracks, unsure of how to proceed. Hell in a fucking can, I said, putting as much aggressive authority in my voice as I could muster. Trust and believe, if I so much as think you're about to come through and jump at us, I swear to fucking Thor himself, I will kill everyone in this fucking building just to deny you the goddamn privilege. I punctuated by spitting on the floor. I have a notion that this'll burn your dumbass little house to the fucking ground too. Test me. I triple dog dare you, you goddamn bitch mouth. I was pissing into the wind with this one and hoping I got no splashbacks. There was no way in hell I'd burn my fellow marines or the kid alive. The boys knew that. I knew that. I just needed the voice, or the old man, the house, whoever the fuck, not to know that. The voice was quiet. The rumbling completely died away beneath my boots. The air seemed to lose some of its angry energy. The house seemed like it had some of the wind bled out of its sails. A deep sigh rumbled up from the darkness of the house. It sounded like an old man wheezing through diseased lungs. It would have been an almost pitiable sound, but given the circumstances, all it served to do was twist the tension screw deeper into our guts. No telling that this was a good thing or not. Nothing happened for a few moments. We just stood there, weapons pointed out into the darkness, waiting for something to happen. Sure, bitch. Chumpers grumbled. I guess we're on your time. We'll wait. The house chose that moment to send forth its avatar. Footsteps came from the hallway directly in front of us, across the room full of body parts. 
The light on our own weapons started to brighten, as if we'd just put fresh batteries in them. I think the forces at work were trying to dump the ambient theatrics. The footsteps sounded like they were coming toward us. I noticed the cam lights we'd thrown down were starting to regain their luminance. Details in the hallway started to come back into focus. Stay cool, gents. I whispered to the boys. I noticed a pair of feet entered the edge of the red cam stick's light. They soon turned into legs. As they moved forward, they revealed more of their owner. It was the old man. He was moving slowly, wearing a filthy white dish dasha. Looked like it had a few bullet holes in it, but shit, so did everything at this point. His arms were raised in a gesture that seemed to be a request for momentary peace. A parlay. He stopped at the edge of the room, standing just inside the main chamber, and turned his head, taking in the gore of the room. A small, almost imperceptible smile played out across his face. He turned his eyes in our direction. They weren't angry. They didn't look like a portal to hell or any wild shit like that. Just looked like the eyes of a slightly bemused old man. He ran his gaze across all of us, settling on each of us for a few moments before ending with me. There was something to him. I just couldn't put my thumb on. A certain malevolence. He looked like an old man, but I knew he was more than that. I twigged that he might have been the monster. Hell, he could have been the whole house for all I knew. You are the head man of these fighters, he stated more than asked, amusement in his ancient voice. I nodded, keeping the Willy Peak grenade held high. My thumb threw the loop of the pen. Well, no fucking shit, Chompers claimed in front of the peanut gallery. The old man ignored him, keeping his attention focused on me. You're very brave, he said with a mocking sneer. It has been a very long time since such brave men stood in arrogant defiance before me. He gave a little, vaguely disgusted shake of his head. The people change. The tools change. The ways change, but the arrogance... The righteous arrogance remains the same. His brow furrowed as he went on, his eyes grown darker. But I think you do this for different reasons than those who stood before. I know you are not of this land. I know you do not understand the purpose of what is done here. Why it is done. Well, you could have a very good reason for chopping up kids, I responded trying to keep the nerves out of my voice. But I don't fucking see what it would be, I mean, beyond some weird pervert shit. There are reasons beyond your station, beyond more perversions. You would never understand. You are but an ant trying to comprehend a hawk, he said, getting way up in the saddle of his moral high horse. You don't know the darkness held at bay by the sacrifice to my horde. Your fire will not destroy me. You do not possess the power to end my work. You are nothing. You have no comprehension of what I do. You have no comprehension of how minuscule the tithe to my horde is in comparison to what I hold back. You sound like every other asshole out there trying to justify their bullshit. You're a spooky fuck, I'll give you that much, but... You're no goddamn different from any other diabolical sack of shit out there. Some vague-ass mention of some vague-ass enemy that you have to keep back by doing some minor unpleasantries. I was shaking my head as I spoke, not even attempting to hide the disgust I felt in this degenerate creature. Bullshit aside, I got a feeling you're threatened by us, and I got a feeling you don't want me to light this fucker off. I said, shaking the grenade at him. Otherwise, why the fuck would you be out here talking to the ants? Because we can fuck your shit up, can't we, bitch mouth? The old man said nothing. He merely glared at us. His eyes were dark, and I could feel the floor starting to rumble under my boots again. He opened his mouth as if to say something, but closed it again. Like he couldn't think of the right thing to say. His hands were clenched into fists at his waist and I noticed faint strands of black goo starting to leak out from the corners of his mouth. 
He looked pissed in a frustrated sort of way. A faint noise reached out to us from the dark beyond the reach of our weapon lights. Cinelac agitated growling. You could tell that we were getting to him. Now consider this a PSA. If a marine is ever talking shit to you, never put off a sign that it's getting to you. We eat that shit up, and we'll dig in deeper. Supernatural spook show or not, this dude was showing every sign he possibly could that it was getting deep into his feelings. Blood in the water for a shit-talking marine. I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Ghetto threw his two cents in. And stop me if I'm wrong, but you let us in thinking you were gonna fuck us up. But you had to learn the hard way that we just don't give a shit. Ghetto had a note of petty humor in his voice, and that seemed to piss the old man off even more. His face went from pissed off to twisted anger. Now you're pissed, and you don't know what to do. When I was putting Buckshot into that bitch-ass game thing, I heard it. And that surprised the fuck out of you. Did. Gato was cut off by a fresh wave of roaring echoing throughout the house. It sounded like it was coming directly from in front of us, where the old man stood. But his lips weren't moving. I'm scary as hell, and I almost pulled the pin on the grenade right there and then. Leave my home, you disrespectful beasts! The old man hissed through a clenched jaw. Leave my home, take that meat, and never return! I will not stand for this. Leave my home, take this arrogance with you, and promise to cease your attack. I will let you live. I will not seek retribution. Just go! Very generous terms, I had to say. Door's back. Just kind of melted out of the wall. I heard creepy whisper. There was a noise that sounded like a rattling doorknob. It's locked. You agree to cease this arrogant hostility? The old man demanded. An urgent tone to his voice. I briefly weighed my options. Fight through the house against unknown odds, risking our lives in a violent pissing contest with a swirling tooth monster and a cranky old fart who appeared to be some manner of brujo. Not to mention the house itself. Or glide on out of here and just leave it behind. The marine in me wanted to tell the old man to eat shit and empty my mag into him. The leader in me knew that that might not be the wisest course of actions. I had people I was responsible for. I had to act in their best interest. And I just didn't have enough information on this guy's capabilities. Yeah, I agreed to his terms. We'll put our dicks away if you drop your skirt. The old man looked briefly perplexed by my response, but eventually he nodded back at me. I heard the door creak open behind me. Door's unlocked, Creepy said from my back. Let's get whilst the getting's good. Four marines coming out was the only response as Creepy moved through the door. I moved to the side as Chumpers and Gato backed towards me, and the open door. I was going to be the last one out of this shit show. I handed the kid off to Gato as he passed and started backing out myself, as soon as the boys broke the threshold. I was holding the grenade like a talisman against evil as it went. The old man just watched us go, eyes damn near burning with anger. He didn't look happy, then I noticed that more of the black shit was drooling from his mouth. But I figured he was going to hold up his end of the deal. Are we really going to let this motherfucker live? I heard Chomper whisper from outside. No. I was halfway outside the door when I pulled the pin on the grenade. The old man didn't seem to twig that anything was wrong until it landed at his feet. But by that point, I was already slamming the door closed. Those Willy Peak grenades have a fuse of about two seconds. They go off with a whoosh, followed by a crackling of igniting phosphorus, neither of which were loud enough to hear from outside, especially of the enraged roaring from the inside of the house. I didn't even want to think about those pieces of kids burning. That would have been nightmare for you. I think we just shit in his Cheerios. Something slammed against the other side of the door, making it buck in its frame. I brought my M4 up and fired for the first time that night. Rounds impacted the door in three round bursts. Splinters burst from the old timber. I fired ten times, emptying the magazine in about three seconds. By the time my trigger went click on empty chamber, 
The door looked like a wooden cheese grater with a basketball-sized hole in the midsection. The roaring died down after that. I could see the firelight flickering through the splintered holes in the door. Mr. Peter was working his magic, and he was going to eat that house. I grabbed Chomps by his arm and pulled him away from the door as I ran. We made it back to the Humvee before the smoke really started pouring out the holes in that door. Gatto had the kid lying out in the sand on the far side of the gun truck. He had the med bag we kept in the truck out and was doing a better job of bandaging the kid than I could have. Gatto had six kids of his own, so of course the kid was the first priority. Creepy had his M4 across the hood of the truck providing security on the door we'd just come out of. You guys okay? A familiar voice came out from the nighttime darkness. It was our platoon sergeant. In all the other shit going on, I hadn't even noticed the rest of the platoon moving in and setting up positions around us, providing security on the house. MRAPs and Humvees moving up in a 180 degree cordon on the house. Belt fed weapons zeroed in. The cavalry had arrived. Late. Yeah. I called back as he made his way towards us, dragging an annoyed looking platoon commander in his wake. We got a civilian casualty here. The kid. He's pretty fucked up. We need a doc. Why do I smell smoke? The PC asked us upon reaching. We set his house on fire, sir. I said matter of factly, holding my weapon light on the kid, while Gatto put an IV in his arm. Please tell me you're joking. Afraid not, sir. There was a monster and all kind of fucked up shit in there. Seemed like the thing to do at the time. The platoon sergeant and the platoon commander looked at each other. Both of them had a concerned look in their faces, similar to the ones they'd had when they talked to the imam earlier. Did you make liaison with the occupant? The platoon commander asked. The old guy? Yes, sir. We met him. He's in the house. I think I might have shot him whilst he was trying to get out. The platoon commander's eyes grew wide, quickly followed by narrowing into angry slits as the full weight of what I said landed on him. He looked up at the house as flames started creeping out of the shut-up door. It was made mostly out of concrete and mud bricks, so it wasn't going to burst into a raging inferno like a wood house would, but the inside of the house was going to be a firestorm before too long. Judging by the flames popping up behind the windows, that firestorm was likely well underway. The platoon commander's hand popped open into a straight edge. I could tell the knife hand was coming, likely followed by an ass chewing. This was in the movies, and shooting a foreign national and setting his house on fire is generally frowned upon, no matter how fucking weird shit is. The burning house chose that moment to distract the platoon commander from his wrath by collapsing outward, like something was pushing the walls from within. With a thunderous crash, cinder blocks and burning detritus fell within arm's reach of the Humvee and the Marines standing on the far side of it, pushing a heat wave in front of it. I instinctively put my hand up to ward off the intense heat. There's something in the fire. I heard the platoon sergeant say quietly, almost like I didn't believe what he was seeing. I dropped my hand from in front of my face. There was a movement in the flame, all right. Something big. A pair of wings resembling what you'd find on a bat spread from the center of the flaming rubble. The tips of the wings ended in large bony spikes. A guttural, throaty roar tore out of the flames and a head sitting on a long neck rose into the sky. It looked like a dog's skull had been shoved onto a crocodile's head. Black goo fell from the toothy maw in a torrent, washing down its chest. Its eyes blazed with anger, black fire flaring from its square pupils, deep set in a craggy face. This thing looked like a demon had a three-way with a dragon and an alligator. Ugly as hell. Ugly as hell and big. It had to be pushing a wingspan of at least 50. With that, the head swooped forward, jaws on hinging like a snake. A white-hot burst of flame spewed up from its gullet with a hissing sound that reminded me of a flamethrower going off. I could feel the intense ambient heat rolling into me like a shockwave. The jet of flame rolled across the four-wheel MRAP, and I could see the gunner duck down in his turret to escape the firestorm coming his way. I don't think it did him much good. The trick's tires popped and the paint started to scorch over. I swear I saw the armor start to melt and turn into slag before it went up like it had been struck by a hellfire missile. Now, in the movies, this is the part where our brave platoon commander would fix his bayonet, order everyone to return fire, charge the beast with his blade, 
and be crowned the new king of Siberia or some, some shit like that. But this wasn't the movies. Marines are trained to react to violence with even more violence. Some of the guys broke off and ran into the night toward our FOB, but most of us returned fire. It was mostly just flat out panic fire, weapons going off at the cycle rate, but it was a big target, and it was a lot of target to hit. Rifle and machine gun fire started at first. 5.56 and 7.62 rounds slammed into the monster's flesh, center mass mostly, but that seemed to do nothing but annoy it. It shoved the wreckage aside, pushing its way towards the line of gun trucks and dismounted infantry. I'd like to tell you this was the beginning of some massive battle, but somebody got the bright idea to break out an AT-4, which is a single-use anti-tank rocket. I think it was the guy we all called Geek. Using it to fight a dragon monster, classic Geek move. The rocket tore out the darkness and caught that thing right in the groove where its thigh met its body. The ear-shattering explosion tore its right leg off of its pelvis, shooting a dragon monster in the dick with an anti-tank rocket. Another classic geek move. The giant leg was thrown pretty far from the dragon. It landed across the hood of a Humvee gun truck, bouncing the truck on its suspension. Black gore bleeding from the ragged end of the leg. The marine in the turret stood up and peered down over the barrel of his crew-served weapon, his mouth hanging open in shock. I couldn't blame him. A piece of dragon was splayed across the hood of his truck like an eight-point buck being taken home for stuffing a mountain. I watched tracer fire converge on the down monster as it tried to use its wing-like arms to scrabble deeper into the rubble of its former home. But its newly acquired disabled status was giving it problems. It was whimpering and mewling as it tried to dig back into its shattered wreckage of a home. It may have been trying to get itself into cover. It didn't get very far. I heard what had to be a 203 going off. The monster made a sound like a giant rabbit letting out a death cry as the grenade found a spot along its upper back to burst. That was about it for the monster. Its body fell forward into the fiery rubble. The one remaining leg twitched for a bit, but that was it. A bit anticlimactic, I know. The next few days were kind of a blur. A shit ton of debriefs that verged on interrogations. There was a whole lot of disbelief and denial flying around, which was weird, since there was 40 foot long corpse that seemed to be a dragon strapped to a tank transporter parked outside our battalion command post. You'd think they'd have been a little more accepting of me and my boy's stories. The kid told a story from his hospital bed about getting pulled off the street in a village about 40 miles away and waking up strapped to a ceiling. I met all manner of brass and government officials and got disbelieving looks from a bunch of them, but the evidence was stacked in my favor. One, a dead dragon. Two, a ton of human remains pulled from the house. Three, a melted AMRAP which is hard to do. There was enough evidence, enough that they couldn't call me an outright liar, but I could tell I wasn't being 100% believed about the old man in the house that roared at us. All except for one. The last one guy I spoke to. He walked into the room my debriefing interviews had been held in and had three letter agency written all over him. From the black polo to the tan operator pants and the government issued haircut. We shook hands, he introduced himself as Tom, and he told me to have a seat. He took a seat on the other side of the table I was sitting at and picked up a manila folder that had been sitting on the table. He got straight down to reading it, and ignored me for a good 15 minutes whilst reading it. I waited for him to finish quietly. I was in no hurry. I had nowhere else to be, so I watched his face as he read. Occasionally, he would nod like he approved of something. Eventually, he sat down the folder, steepled his fingers in front of his face, and stared at me. You know, the only reason you held him off in the house, with just 5.56 and buckshot, you ask me? No, sir. I slowly shook my head. He was nearing the end of his lifespan and his power was bleeding off. Most likely only had a couple hundred years left in him, Tom said, as if that explained everything. Nevertheless, you handled yourself well, Sergeant, and brought all your Marines out alive. You may have opened a whole new can of unpleasant worms by killing them, but I don't hold you in a bad regard for that. Uh, I stammered out. Thanks? 
That example really didn't clear things up for me like Tom might have thought it would. Of course, Tom said, dropping his finger steeple from his face and leaning back in his chair slightly. I can see you're not completely clear on what I'm talking about. I'm saying I like the way you handle yourself after stumbling into something you had no chance of being prepared for. You achieved your objective, remained mentally flexible whilst doing it, and came out ahead. Tell me, Marine. Do you want a job? <laughs>